Dear friends and foes of medieval wrestling, welcome to this presentation. I initially gave it at the Drine event in Vienna, which was concluded a few days ago. Unfortunately, we had a number of technical problems, and therefore it was deemed that recording the presentation did not make much sense. And so I have decided to go through my PowerPoint again in a slightly rearranged and extended version and to allow all of you to gain access to these videos via Drine's YouTube channel. The starting point for this presentation actually was the Kickstarter project of Hema Bookshelf, who did a facsimile of Baumann's Fechtbuch or Codex Wallerstein. And in addition, they have also published, as they usually do, a companion book with uh, various offers, as you can see here. If you're interested in purchasing either the facsimile or the companion book, uh, you can find them on Michael's website or various sellers. I am sure there is still some around of each of those. So let us briefly see what is included in this companion book. You have articles on codicology, on comparable treatises, uh, on the various sections of the manuscript, and of course you also have a transcription and translation. The transcription was done by Dirk Kagedorn and the translation by Mr. Tobler and Miss Finley. And uh, I have done one of the proofreading runs and it seems that some of my notes were included. I think, even though I might not agree with every single detail of the final translation, it is still the best English translation of uh, Baumann's Fechtbuch that we currently have. And... Uh, Therefore, it is finally also available for an English-speaking audience. However, what I want to talk to you about today is my own article in here, which has the same title as this presentation. I will try to present some of the main points I made in there. But since I am now not really pressed for time anymore, I can also go beyond what I was able to include in these uh, 27 pages in there. And uh, of course, I can also show you a lot more pictures, both from the treatise, but also from uh, modern instruction materials on grappling. But uh, first of all, what uh, can you expect from these videos? Um, there will be three parts. For technical reasons, I cannot make uh, videos that are too long this way. So in this first part, we We'll talk about the sources I have used. We will talk about the, uh, what I have termed angles of attack, which is basically the scope of the article and the presentation. We will have a very, very brief look on the codicology of uh, Baumann's Fechtbuch, therefore the influences and also the reception. And then we will talk about the armed and unarmed wrestling in the older section C of Baumann's Fechtbuch. In the next video, we are going to have a more in-depth look at the introduction of uh, the wrestling section B, 
which includes tactical advice for wrestling, and we will compare that uh, to some degree to what tactical advice is given in grappling sports today. Then we have a small inset on the Geselliges Ringen, therefore on medieval wrestling rule sets. Then we will look at the didactic structure of section B in comparison to modern grappling books. And finally, in part three, we will have a look at some of the techniques of the wrestling section B. We will try to see what might be missing in this book. And then finally, I will draw a few conclusions. But now on to part one of this video series. As promised, here are the sources. Of course, uh, the first and main source are the scans from uh, Baumann's Fechbuch uh, slash Codex Wallerstein slash code 1642 in the University Library in Augsburg. But um, what I would like to point out, maybe even more than that, is the secondary sources that I have used. Um, first and foremost, of course, are the works of uh, Dr. Rainer Welle, uh, starting with his dissertation, which was written and published in uh, 1993. And then also his edition of Baumann's Fechtbuch, which is extremely extensive, was published in 2014. And I think even though we wrote this companion book, if you can uh, read German at least a little bit, you owe it to yourself to have a look at uh, what Mr. Welle has to say about it, because he is uh, certainly the most foremost expert on medieval wrestling in Germany. Um, as you can see below, I have also listed a number of uh, books on modern grappling. Uh, this is not even a full list, just uh, some of the uh, standard works that you can have a look at. Um, the most extensive one on uh, judo is uh, probably the one by just a second by Mr. Daigo it's not even listed here as I can see right now but whatever so um, you have a, a very large number of books on judo which uh, you can check out the books on wrestling are a little bit harder to find maybe in most cases especially the east german and russian ones and the ones that were published by fila um, but uh, if you have a look around you might still be able to locate one or the other and um, then again we have a few more sources on Sambo, on the Chinese and Indonesian styles, as well as uh, Schwingen and Rankeln, which you can see on the previous slide. For me personally, the oral sources were even more important, which in this case is my coaches. In the past 15 years, I have had a very high number of coaches, mostly in Greco and freestyle wrestling. The most important ones of these are Mr. Engelhardt from Nuremberg in Germany and Mr. Abdul Kadyrov from Derbent in Dagestan, Russia. It uh, in um, they have basically given me the necessary vocabulary and the practical experience to be able to work with the 
um, written sources on modern grappling, which might uh, already tell you something. It's not all that common for wrestlers and grapplers to even read books on their own sport. I was always a little bit of an oddball here. I was uh, reading basically everything I could get my hands on and uh, watching all the videotapes I could find at the time. But um, normally that is something people start to get into only if they consider to coach themselves. Now, in grappling sports, for the most part, it's uh, rather uncommon for coaches to become famous, even if all of the people you can see here have produced um, nationally and in some cases even internationally successful competitors. The most famous of the bunch is uh, probably Mr. Kurugliev, a pupil of Mr. Abdul Kadyrov, and as you can see, he has been doing rather well for himself in terms of success in competition. But either way, um, as I have hinted already, I will for the most part be taking a wrestler's perspective on the matter rather than an academic one, even though the article, of course, um, still fits into the standards of academia. Whether you like that or not is up to you. You can maybe tell me in the comments or write me an email or something, whatever. So, what am I trying to do here? My um, main idea was to compare the tactical advice, the techniques and the didactics to modern grappling sports, more specifically to the printed media of modern grappling sports. And uh, I think that is an important distinction because as you might be able to see later on, even modern printed media on this subject are usually not intended to be a um, do-it-yourself, teach-yourself guide. They are intended to be complementary to what you actually learn hands-on in training. From a more practically oriented viewpoint, we have the term of frog DNA, which is derived, of course, from the first Jurassic Park movie. It is a term that was used by some of the Hema dinosaurs, so to speak. I think it was uh, John Clements and um, uh, some of his compatriots that came up with it. And the idea basically is that there are some gaps in the sources on medieval martial arts. Some are more obvious, some are less obvious, but these gaps need to be filled with something. And um, basically, I am suggesting that when it comes to Ringen, the frog DNA um, could well come from um, modern grappling sports, um, as in the mechanics, the various variations of techniques, how you get into a technique, how you finish the technique. Um, you can have a look there. Now, as you probably guessed, this idea is neither new nor original. There is a publication from 1922 titled Alte und Neue Raufkunst. And um, the author basically compares the techniques of uh, medieval Ringen to the 
Japanese jiu-jitsu, which started becoming popular at the time. And it's a fun and interesting read, even though I have to point out that, of course, the author's goal basically was to um, quote-unquote demonstrate that uh, jiu-jitsu had been a part of German culture for quite some time, and uh, these uh, Japanese instructors didn't really uh, teach anything new or groundbreaking. Then we have some terminological points, um, chief of which is what is a technique and what is the variation. As we will see, the various um, sports go about this distinction in different ways. For example, here we have seven techniques from judo they are seven distinctive throws and they are grouped in um, a number of technical groups like taiyotoshi for example is a hand technique and ogoshi is a hip technique however uh, some of them are leg techniques and so on uh, however in wrestling all of these would be considered variations of the hip throw. Now, that of course is due to the history and the didactics of uh, these two styles. Like judo was uh, created with the idea to be more structured, while on the other hand, uh, wrestling tends to be more individualistic, like. Um, not every wrestler will learn the uh, same techniques. Um, it will depend very much on the coach, on the school, and in some sometimes also on the wrestler. Um, there is a few basic techniques that everybody probably learns at one point or another. However, when it comes to these variations, um, most wrestlers will uh, probably not learn all of them. Again, it depends on the school. For example, the uh, Russian slash Dagestani school of freestyle is extremely rich in techniques and variations. We, depending on who you ask, uh, uh, common numbers are 300 to 1,000. And um, basically, every wrestler is expected to learn all the techniques that the school has to offer, ideally to the point where he can teach them to other people, at which point these techniques would be considered his passive repertoire. So if he does not know a technique well enough to teach it, it's not part of his passive repertoire. However, in competition, even if you look at international level, um, you will notice that most wrestlers only um, ever do a small handful of techniques in competition. And um, the number is actually surprisingly constant. It's usually between six and eight of them. And that is considered to be the active repertoire. So, um, while it might seem that I am diverging quite a bit here, I think this might actually be an important point to make also for HEMA, because I have the impression that a lot of people expect um, to see more technical variety in competition. But... Um, if you ask me, that uh, is probably not overly realistic, and in my estimation, it probably wasn't all that realistic um, back then either. I um, think that uh, the categories of the passive and the active repertoire um, really should be considered to be um, uh, not a new invention. Um, of course, 
the idea is that um, every wrestler chooses different techniques from these 300 or 1000 techniques that there are um, and they should be suited to his uh, physique, to his body type and also to his mentality, um, which would mean that having a large passive repertoire is actually one of the hallmarks of a good coach. But enough of that for now. And finally, we will look uh, at the question of what makes a good wrestling book. So, back to Baumann's Fechtbuch. As you can see here, the treatise is, uh, uh, consists of three parts, A to C. C, marked in green here, being the oldest, it was probably written in the 1420s. And then we have two parts, A and B, which were both written most likely in the years between 1465 and 1470 by separate scribes. And um, what interests us here is uh, part B, which uh, is one of the most extensive sources on um, wrestling in medieval Germany. The it is not entirely clear whether A and B were ever intended to uh, be bound together. However, the three parts were um, passed through various hands until finally in uh, 1556 they were bought by our uh, very own patron saint and martyr Paulus Hector Meyer. Uh, who probably also rebound them in the fashion that uh, you can see now. It is a very small book, like I passed around the facsimile at the, during the presentation. Uh, it's basically an A5 with uh, minor um, differences. Uh, it uh, contains 110 folios. Um, as you can see here, and um, there were two scribes plus notes from Paulus Hector. And uh, it seems that there were, was a total of uh, five painters involved in the process, um, three alone in part C. What interests us here is that uh, over 100 pages in total are devoted to unarmed wrestling. And um, sections, uh, like parts of the three sections, were copied by uh, the Gladiatoria, most famously by Albrecht Dürer, which is the reason why there was. Um, interest in uh, the in Baumann's Fechtbuch already in the 19th century, um, even though it uh, mostly occurred in the form that people tried to praise Dürer's execution of the paintings over the originals, um, which um, is something that uh, by now we also see a little bit more nuanced. Then uh, Paulus Hector also copied um, several Stücks. Interestingly enough, apart from Dürer, um, what was copied the most is actually part C, the oldest part, rather than part B, the extensive wrestling section, um, which might be due to the fact that uh, by the time the word got out, so to speak, by the time um, we actually have printed media and uh, a book could be made available to a large audience. There already were a number of other works out there on the subject, most famously probably the book written by uh, Fabian von Auerswald and uh, illustrated by Lukas Kranach. So let us look at uh, the 
wrestling techniques, the unarmed wrestling techniques in Wallerstein or Baumann's Fechtbuch section C. And here they are, all of them. So as you can see, it is a total of eight techniques, which by all means is not very much, but still, I think they are fairly interesting, especially when you put them in context. And then uh, we will have a closer look later on. So uh, maybe just pause the video for a moment and have a good look at uh, the pictures because on the next slide they will be much smaller and I will try to explain what we might see there. So on the left, you uh, can see uh, the pictures again, and then I have uh, tried to find uh, analogous techniques in modern grappling sports. Here I have just used the terminology from wrestling, uh, the English terminology from wrestling, which is quite a bit different from the German one that I'm more, more familiar with. And on, uh, I also have included the terminology from judo, which is helpful because unlike wrestling, where um, the terminology tends to be to a certain degree a lot more regional than um, in other sports, like um, in, in Germany, in the south they call a technique by one name and in the north they will look at you funny uh, if you call it that and uh, it can be uh, even more extreme than that however in judo uh, wherever you go in the world quite usually if uh, you uh, give the official name of a technique people will know what you're talking about so let us look at the first technique, which um, in wrestling would be a variation of an inside single leg. And uh, uh, as we can see on these pictures here, um, we can also see already here, these pictures are from Shaf Murado's um, Freestyle Wrestling, which is one of the most interesting books on the subject, in, in my opinion. But as we can see here, uh, there is a number of variations how it can be done. The left knee can be down, the right knee can be down. Um, the head might, uh, just a second. The head might be ducked under the opponent's armpit, or as we can see in the treatise, it might actually press against the opponent's biceps. As you probably expected, there is also people who uh, do this very technique with a suplex. Wrestlers like to turn almost everything into a suplex. And uh, in judo, it would be called the Kuchiki Taoshi. And uh, I have tried to find a picture which is uh, more or less similar to what we see in the treatise. But, um, that is also an interesting point. While the terminology in judo is uh, rather constant, um, you still have a large variety of techniques which are grouped under that name. So on the next folio, um, folio 99 recto, on the left, we see an outside single with an outside hook like the outside hook is uh, the leg which goes around the opponent's leg from the outside, as you can see here. And uh, it is done with a push on the opponent's chest. Now, in modern wrestling, you will probably never see it done this way. And that is due to the wrestling stance in freestyle, which is a lot lower than what you can see in the treatises. And therefore, the techniques need to be um, modified to a certain degree. 
However, I can guarantee you that if you can drop somebody who is standing in a low freestyle stance, then you will have absolutely no trouble to drop somebody who is standing nice and upright with the same technique. Now, as you can see in the section, second picture, the Sukuinage in Judo is actually quite a bit closer to what we can see uh, on the left in on uh, Folio 99 Rector. And uh, that is due to the fact that in Judo, the stance tends to be more upright. Um, and that is also due to the rule set. Like the rule set actually enforces the upright stance and will punish you if uh, you wrestle bent over. And on the right, we can see a standard fireman's carry slash katakuruma in Judah. Once again, the execution you see done by the judoka is closer to what you see in the treatise. Again, that is due to the stance. However, I should point out that the standing version as of the kataguruma, as seen here, is rarely ever seen in, uh, or has rarely ever been seen in judo competition in the past decades. And uh, uh, several authors, such as Masahiko Kimura, have noted that you should go down on the knees as wrestlers do. Um, I should also mention that this specific version of Kataguruma by now is illegal in a judo competition because it involves a grip to the legs, which is also true for the Kuchiki Toshi. So um, while these techniques are often closer to the execution of, the, uh, of what you see in the treatises, there is no guarantee that you will actually be taught the standard variation anymore because it's illegal in competition since 2013. Thank you very much. Now, folio 99 verso. On the left, we see an outside hook from a cross collar tie, um, which is the tie up in this done in this fashion would be illegal in wrestling for a change. Um, but uh, the mechanics are very similar to a normal outside hook as illustrated below. Um, maybe a short note on that, like you can hook with almost any part of your leg, uh, whether it's the foot, whether it's the calf, whether it's the knee as seen here. All of these have their advantages and disadvantages. Some of them are harder to count than others. Um, um, others are more sneaky and depend more on finesse to work. Uh, I apologize, I uh, didn't really find uh, um, an ideal picture of this technique from Judo. I picked this one because I think that the way he enters into the throw is actually fairly comparable to what you would expect to happen here. Now, the technique on the right is rather interesting. You could call it either a reverse lift with an inside leg grip in wrestling, or you could call it a reverse inside single with the right arm inside. Um, the reverse lift, of course, was made famous by Alexander Karelin at Super Heavyweight. Um, this is one way you could uh, try to finish this technique. There is also a variety of other ways or other directions where you could go from it. Like uh, this technique offers you um, a very large number of possible follow-ups, some of which I have uh, listed here. Um, like here, uh, the wrestler in red is going to go into a Turk and uh, is going to pin his opponent while falling onto him. Um, here we have a very sneaky finish uh, with a reverse grip um, on the inside and here we would have a more standard variation like uh, blocking the far leg and dropping the guy over. Um, in my experience 
if you do uh, wrestling technique in HEMA, most people will fall already when you lift their leg. However, when you are um, training with or competing against trained wrestlers, you will have to get a little bit more inventive because uh, they basically all have a fairly decent sense of balance. On to folio 100 recto. Um, the technique on the left would be an outside hip or trip in wrestling. Um, these are not all that commonly done in wrestling because uh, especially this uh, variation here is uh, not all that hard to counter in wrestling. You try to look for very asymmetric uh, starting situations as can be seen here. Um, an outside trip done with um, a double inside grip on the arm, which we can also see later on in section B. Uh, in Judo it would be called uh, probably an Osoto Otoshi. Um, I have discussed uh, this uh, ter term with my uh, Judo friends and uh, they basically all agreed that uh, that would most likely be what you call it. Then uh, on the right we have a variation of the fireman's carry which uh, is uh, fairly common in the medieval treatises. Um, it's not all that common in modern wrestling. In um, my school it's called the Cup Khan, which is uh, translates as bird trap. Um, I'm not going to go into that right now, but um, what it is basically it's a fireman's carry with a leg grip from the outside, which quite which changes the dynamic of the throw quite a bit. I think it's much easier to lift than the standard variation. Um, and it's actually more similar to the fireman's carry variations that you can see in Greco or also in uh, Judo today. Um, in both cases you are not supposed to grab the legs but uh, you can post at the hips of the opponent. And finally on folio 100 verso we see a spear double leg or bar cigar in wrestling. Basically you just ram the guy with your head in the chest or belly area um, or you um, take him over sideways and actually I think there is some indication on this picture which might indicate that uh, there is not a straightforward um, direction of movement um, but again uh, that uh, could be discussed. And in uh, Judo, of course, it would be called the Morotigari. And um, the, here we can see a, a style of execution which is uh, not too dissimilar from what we can see here. As you might expect, you can find similar techniques also in other treatises. Um, here I have uh, included uh, the similarities that already were pointed out by Rainer Bell in 2014. Um, and here uh, with Meyer we can see um, copies of the techniques from section C, which is interesting because Meyer gives you also explanations of these techniques which are lacking in uh, Baumann's Fechtbuch Part C. I have also looked around and I found a number of uh, other treatises which feature similar techniques. Um, I have included just two here and uh, that is uh, first the uh, older edition of the Blume des Kampfes which might date to about the same period as um, Baumann's Fechtbuch Part C. 
and uh, we can also find a similar thing to this uh, grip on the neck with the crossed arms in a furious section on the short stick. Of course, we can also find uh, similar things in Tannhofer, however, with the difference that uh, Tannhofer actually shows one version of the Feynman's carry or uh, Durchlaufen, as you would call it in medieval wrestling, um, where he seems to be going down on one knee, um, which is not something that you never see in a dissection, as we can see here, the knees clearly down and the knee also appears to be down here um, but it's not shown for the fireman's carry uh, and we go on again we start with the pictures of Meyer um, I should uh, mention that uh, this one here while being the same technique was actually copied from Fabian von Auerswald's book which Meyer has included almost entirely in his two illustrated treatises. Again, we can find similar things in the Blume des Kampfes, although the style of depiction is often quite different, like they have chosen a different phase of the technique to depict, um, but uh, it is still the same technique, um, also the angle, and um, as you can see here, um, we would uh, probably be talking about variations of the same throw. Um, like, um, even though the grip on the opponent is slightly different, biomechanically, you still have the same thing going on. Now, as I have mentioned, Wallerstein Part C does not include any text, just like the older version of Blume des Kampfes. And um, that may seem like a bad thing. However, I would argue it can also have its advantages. Um, as we will see later on in books on modern wrestling, um, the various techniques that are taught are often regarded like pieces of a puzzle, and therefore they can be, or similarly to, because unlike pieces of a puzzle, you can combine them together in any way that they might fit and therefore I have um, tried to give you a few ideas about possible um, combinations of techniques uh, which in wrestling we call chain wrestling so from uh, this outside hip throw here or zwo uh, hufe as Auswald would call it um, if you bring this overhook across the opponent's chest, like you pass it in front of his head, you could go to either of these two techniques, uh, the inside single and the outside single. And uh, you could also flow from one of these to the other. Like, uh, for example, if you're trying to take him down here, to the right and he makes a step in this direction you can also step around his leg and throw him to the other side and vice versa so um, that is basically a constant in most grappling styles you always try to offset the opponent's balance and you try to trick him to move in a way that will save you effort and energy so that you can take him down using his own momentum like judo has uh, really uh, made a point about this however you will find it in basically every wrestling style around the world so it's not an exclusive thing 
Now, here is a combination which I find uh, interesting. However, this one only works in this direction. Um, so you can enter for a regular fireman's carry with a grip in between the legs. In case the opponent steps his, in this case, left leg back and you cannot grip it, you can still reach around your back and go for the cup gun, for the bird trap, fireman's carry, and throw him that way. And if in the process you also lose a hold of the hand, which is the most important element to bring off a fireman's carry, or the contact point of the shoulder, which this guy uh, already has lost to some extent, you can abandon the hand and instead seize the left leg from the inside and throw him that way. Now, if you really want to get creative, you can also chain these two techniques together. You can uh, either enter with the outside hook from the cross collar, um, and then if he manages to step his left leg out from your hook, if he steps this leg back, you can let go of the collar and just blast double him. Or if um, you start in with a blast double, you um, don't manage to get a hold of his head, uh, hand, uh, his legs, because he sprawls on you. You can try to uh, establish a cross collar tie and then drop him with an outside hook. However, it uh, also gets more interesting when we talk about Wallerstein Part C because with one single exception, all of the techniques are also featured in the armed fighting stücks. And you might even argue that the last technique is also in there because it's a variation of another one that you can see. However, um, anyway, we can see the outside single done here, um, unarmed and here in armor. Um, it's also a variation because here he's kneeling and here he's standing, so that seems to be okay. Um, and of course, you can cross collar somebody if you have a dagger in the hands. Um, it's also not uh, entirely the same situation when you look at the legs, like here the outside hook is in place, and here it appears as if the opponent had actually stepped on the attacker's foot. Um, you see a whole lot of foot stepping going on um, in Wallerstein part C. And um, you also see that in modern wrestling. If you, look, if you know where to look. And uh, arguably we have the same technique as up here also here down in the armed section, um, this arm across the opponent, the, the attacker's back, doesn't really change anything. Um, he will still be thrown, maybe even in a worse manner. Now, interestingly enough here, the two pictures are placed next to each other, uh, and that almost appears to be intentional. Um, as if the um, painter was basically trying to uh, make the connection or maybe he was uh, copying one um, page into a different context. And um, down here you can see a spear double or blast double with a sword used as a grappling aid. And again, this position might indicate that the intention was to throw the guy sideways rather than straight forward because the head would be in a different uh, position otherwise. But it uh, gets even more fun um, because there is a very large number 
of uh, grappling techniques in the armed section that are not featured uh, in a reasonably similar way in the unarmed wrestling section. Like it appears that um, the armed fighting for section C really is what it's all about. And we might guess why it is this way. Um, it is not impossible that some pages of unarmed wrestling got lost, but on the other hand, it's also not impossible that these eight techniques were actually considered to be the need to know base for the armed application. And in fact, what we can see here are usually techniques which will, for the most part, work better in an armed context. Um, I have uh, given the modern terminology for uh, all of them in the article. I will not elaborate on it here because, uh, as you may have seen, I have already talked as much as I was talking at the entire presentation at Drain. Um, I would just like to say that my personal favorite here uh, is this uh, illustration here, because what we can see here is a Haken or Hinderwurf. Um, in modern grappling terminology, it would be a grapevine throw. Um, but the really genius piece here is that he's uh, punching him in the face with the shield rim uh, while executing the throw, uh, for which in the article I have chosen the expression admirably vicious. <laughs>